It feels like it has only been in recent years that women's sports and women in sport have raised in profile to the point of piercing wider mainstream awareness. And, despite there being no gender separation between men and women in motorsport, the number of women who compete in all levels of racing championships is often binary, that is to say, mostly ones and zeros. Take Formula 1 for example. There have been a few development drivers and test sessions over the past few years, but when do you think the last time a woman competed in an F1 race was? I'll give you two seconds to answer. Wrong. Unless you said 1976, in which case you're right. Have a biscuit. To alleviate this drought of female drivers, F1 has recently launched the F1 Academy, a support series to F1 to highlight talented prospective women drivers, allowing them to show their skills without having to provide self-financial backing, with the goal of progressing to Formula 3, Formula 2, and eventually Formula 1. The FIA, the equivalent of FIFA for motorsport, does run the girls and cards scheme to get more girls in at the grassroots level, but for drivers, a critical limiting factor in progressing through motorsport is that it's expensive, and if you don't have money it's hard to move up. Women face additional difficulties in raising funds and being taken seriously, making it even more difficult to move up. This is the first time Formula 1 and the FIA have attempted to foster women's talent and is in no doubt supported by F1's increasing global presence and viewership by women, estimated to be about 30% overall and still growing. It marks a major shift from the previous views of women in Formula 1, with former F1 boss Bernie Eccleston suggesting that women should stay at home all day. F1 has also phased out the of grid girls, although some countries didn't get the memo. I can understand why they got rid of them, but I would also like to see grid guys, fast femboys, and Formula No. 1 binaries. Formula 1 is still attempting to have its cake and eat it, by promoting women's inclusion and progression, yet still continue to race in places like the UAE, Qatar, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia, all countries known for their restrictive laws on women's rights. Also, considering the series is called F1 Academy, you'd think it'd be paired up with a good amount of F1 races, but Nope. Of the seven round calendar, only one race is paired to F1, the final round in the United States. Compare this with Formula 2 and Formula 3 where every round they contest is paired with an F1 race. In the latest season of Drive to Survive, the documentary series that peels back the curtain to look at what happens behind closed garage doors, guess what percentage of dialogue was done by women? 20%? 10%? 5%? Nope, 1.5% is the right answer. Analyzing the runtime of the show means that women speak for a collective total of 43 plus 1, divided by 8, carry the 2, about 6 minutes overall. And Red Bull boss Christian Horner has previously said that women were becoming more interested in Formula 1 because the drivers are good looking. But he seems to misunderstand that the interesting part of F1 is when you can't see the drivers' faces, you know, the racing bit. The F1 Academy arose from the collapse of the W Series, which originally attempted to fill in a similar role, with women chosen on merit and ability rather than individual financial backing. The W Series did field a good number of talented women, but there seemed to be little progression to further series, resulting in a core, constant collection of drivers appearing in multiple seasons. Due to financial problems, the series collapsed in late 2022 after just three seasons. But, with the support of the FIA and Formula 1 itself, there is hope that the F1 Academy will allow women an opportunity to get on the motorsport ladder, and eventually to world championships and become world champions. So, considering how the racing calendar has well and truly kicked off, I figured I'd look back at how women have played a role in motorsport's long and venerable history. And, the first woman we're looking at is a trans woman, because it wouldn't be a Minty Mario video otherwise. In fact, in 1948, she became the first known British woman to undergo gender reassignment surgery and her name was Roberta Cowell. Originally studying engineering, she competed in motorsport on the side, entering time trials and hill climb events. When the Second World War began, she halted her motor racing career and joined the RAF, becoming a Spitfire pilot. After the war ended, she returned home, she transitioned and became somewhat of a celebrity, while she continued to compete in motor racing events, although she didn't compete in Grand Prix racing anymore. She withdrew from public life in the 1970s, and it's only been recently that her place in history has been rightfully restored. Speaking of Grand Prix racing, throughout Formula 1's over 1,000 Grand Prix and of the 774 drivers to have driven in F1, only 5 women have entered a Grand Prix, and only 2 of them have actually started one. To put that into comparison, there have been an equal number of women who have competed in F1 as people who have used the flag of Monaco, a country with a population of just 40,000 people. The first woman to enter F1 was Maria Theresa de Philips, who competed with the official Maserati team at a few races in 1958 and 1959. 
She only finished one race, the Belgian Grand Prix at the old Spa circuit that took place on open roads, where she crossed the line in 10th. She did, however, finish 5th at the non-championship Syracuse Grand Prix. She was welcomed as a competitor by the rest of the grid, and she remembers only one instance of sexism against her, when she was denied entry to the 1958 French Grand Prix after the race director said that the only helmet a woman should wear is one of the hairdressers. She left the world of professional motorsport in 1960, although she kept her links with Maserati and became the eventual founder and chairperson of the Maserati's Owners Club. After Dave Phillips, it would be another 15 years years until another woman would compete in Formula 1, and it would undoubtedly be the most famous woman to compete, Lala Lombardi. Competing primarily in 1975, Lombardi drove for the March team, a competent but fairly uncompetitive team whose most notable fact was that it was sponsored by Vomit. She has the most starts for any woman in F1 of 12, and is the only woman to have scored points in a World Championship Grand Prix. At the 1975 Spanish Grand Prix, in a race full of retirements and accidents, Lombardi kept her cool, starting from 24th and finishing 6th, scoring one whole championship point. Or she would have if the race hadn't been red flagged and ended before the full race distance was completed due to the tragic death of four spectators after an incident. As per the rules, points were halved, meaning Lombardi would only score half a point. Lombardi won score points for the rest of the season, and besides a few sporadic entries in 1976, she wouldn't race in F1 again. She did continue racing, competing at the 24 Hours of Le Mans and Italian endurance races before retiring from motorsport in 1988 to start her own team. She passed away in 1992 at the age of 50 due to breast cancer, and in her hometown of Frugarolo, she is immortalized with a sculpture of her. Lombardi was also openly a lesbian, one of only three openly queer drivers to compete in Formula 1, so that's cool. The other two being Mike Butler and Mario Manuel Veloce de Rajoy Cabral. Nicknamed Nisha. Why didn't I just call him Nisha? The next woman to enter Formula 1 was Davina Galista, originally a skier who represented Great Britain at the Winter Olympics. Galista got into motorsport by showing her skills at a celebrity racing event. She entered the 1976 British Grand Prix, but was unfortunately saddled with poor machinery and failed to qualify, although maybe it's because she entered the race with the number 13. She returned in 1978 and attempted to enter a few races with the Heskiff team, whose car used to look like this. A lot of things sure have changed in 50 years, but once again the car was bad and she failed to qualify, with the team shortly going bust afterwards. She would return to the Olympics in 1992, and has been an instructor at racing schools ever since. After Galista, the next woman to compete was South African Desiree Wilson, who entered the 1980 British Grand Prix, where she failed to qualify because she was saddled with poor machinery. She did qualify for her home Grand Prix in 1981 with Tyrrell, but this was a non-championship race. She did run as high as 6th before a gearbox problem forced her to spin out. She does, notably, have a grandstand named after her at the Brands Hatch Circuit in Great Britain. Why you ask? Because she won and is so far the only woman to win a Formula 1 race. I put Formula 1 in air quotes because it was a British Formula 1 race and not a World Championship Formula 1 race. The British Formula 1 Championship was a short-lived series that mostly used older cars from a few seasons before on British tracks, the results of which aren't included in the World Championship history books. The most recent woman to enter a Grand Prix was Giovanna Amati in 1992, while driving for the Brabham team. She, and say it with me now, failed to qualify because the car was terrible. She was dropped after just three races, with her replacement, future world champion Damon Hill, only being able to qualify twice out of eight attempts before the team went bust. And those are the five women who have entered the Formula 1 World Championship. Not full of trophies and success, but F1 is a challenging sport to break into and succeed in when you have all the advantages in the world, like the backing of a wealthy family, the backing of a giant company, or even the backing of an entire country. And sometimes all three of them aren't even enough. Unfortunately, the overall inclusion of Formula 1 in F1 teams is also lacking. An article by Hazel Southwell found that the percentage of women trackside was only around 10%, although there have been a few prominent women in the paddock over the past few years. Manisha Caltonborn and Claire Williams served as team leaders of Salva and Williams respectively. Hannah Schmidt is currently Red Bull's chief strategist since 2021, and during her time in this role, Red Bull has won three world championships and has won over 50% of all F1 races held. Fitness trainer Angela Cullen has worked alongside Lewis Hamilton for seven seasons, during which Hamilton has gone on to achieve unprecedented success. Um, 
the past two years notwithstanding. Hamilton has said that she is one of the greatest things to happen to him and that she is the hardest working individual he knows. And women have been featured more and more as part of broadcast teams, with the likes of Jenny Gao, Lee McKenzie, Susie Perry and Naomi Shreve having all been involved in broadcast teams for BBC, Channel 4 and Sky Sports. But Formula One isn't the be-all and end-all of motorsport, and women have found far more success out of it than in it. Many more women have competed in rallying due to the inherently more accessible nature of rallies compared to open wheel racing, but there is one that stands above all others, the Queen of Spain, Michelle Mouton. Mouton competed sporadically between 1974 and 79, consistently scoring points finishes in French and Monaco rallies with Fiat and Alpine. There were originally suspicions that the car she was using had a special engine that made her better, but it passed FIA scrutiny and it turned out she was just better than most of the drivers. Her big break came in 1980, when she was picked by Audi to be part of their factory squad with their new car, the Quattro, one of the earliest cars to be part of the Fierce and Group B regulations. And having played several hours of Dirt Rally 2.0, I know how unwieldy and terrifying the Audi Quattro is. Oh, that's a big deal. Beginning to compete full-time in 1981, Mouton and her female co-driver Fabrizio Pons won their first rally in San Remo, Italy, before which rival Ari Vatanen said he was going to win the rally and that no woman would ever be able to beat him. In 1982, Mouton and Pons would win three more rallies, going on to finish second in the Drivers' Championship just behind eventual winner Walter Roll. In 1985, Mouton won and set the then record at the Pikes Peak Hill Climb event in the United States, and was involved in the founding of the annual Race of Champions event in 1988, which continues to this day. Mouton was also appointed the head of the FIA Women in Motorsports Commission in 2010, and in 2011 she would receive the Legion of Honor, the highest civilian honor in France for outstanding contributions to motorsport. Her bravery and her achievements were so great that F1 legends Sterling Moss referred to her as one of the best and F1 triple world champion Nikki Lauda would refer to her as a superwoman. There have been a few female co-drivers, the person who sits next to the driver and delivers pace notes, Medium right, concentrate. to stand on the podium since Mouton and Pons, with Ilka Miner achieving eight podiums between 2005 and 2012. Most recently, in 2022, Isabel Galmiche, a maths teacher, would be the co-driver alongside Sebastian Loeb, with the pair winning the Monaco Rally. And, launched in 2019, Extreme E is a hybrid rally raid rally cross thing that uses electric SUVs and requires driver changes mid-race. Each pairing must have one male and one female driver, resulting in female drivers being able to race and compete with legends like Sebastian Loeb, Carlos Sainz Sr and Kevin Hansen. Women have competed in the 24 hours of Le Mans since nearly its inception, with the French pair of Odette Sico and her teammate Marguerite Moros finishing 7th overall in 1930. Two years later, Sico would finish 4th overall, the best overall finish for a woman at the biggest event in endurance racing. Over the past four events, there have been three separate all women's teams to compete, with the Iron Dames team in 2022 achieving the highest finish of 7th in class. 1975 saw the best performance of an all women's team when Christine Dacremont, Marianne Hopfner and Michelle Mouton winning in class. Transgender racer and online personality Charlie Martin is looking to become the first transgender driver to compete at Le Mans, having done well in the likes of the 24 hours of Nürburgring and the North American Lamborghini Cup. She came out in 2018 and has worked on improving trans awareness, acceptance and inclusion in sport. Now, to jump across the pond to America, the likes of IndyCar and NASCAR have had their fair share of female drivers. The pioneer of women's racing in North America was Janet Guthrie, who was the first woman to compete in the Daytona 500 and the first woman to lead a lap in NASCAR. However, her most notable achievement was being the first woman to compete in the Indy 500, entering five times from 1976 to 1980. At her first attempt in 1976, in which she failed to qualify, many competitors said it was because she was a woman. With some help from AJ Foyt, she was able to drive his spare car in the shakedown session, with her top time being enough to get onto the grid, but due to a lack of sponsorship, she was forced to pull out. She qualified for the 77 race in 26 but retired due to what Wikipedia refers to as timing gear. Fun fact, the starting command at the Indy 500 was traditionally Gentlemen, start your engine! Which works when the grid is made of only men, but when Janet Guthrie qualified in 1977, they still wanted to keep it as Gentlemen, 
Start your engines, brothers! Despite, you know, the obvious. Eventually, after much discussion and back and forth, they eventually settled on the command. In company with the first lady ever to qualify at Indianapolis, gentlemen, start your engine! However, the 1978 race would be her best and most memorable performance, when she qualified in the top half of the grid and would drive her way through the field to finish 8th overall. Even more impressive was that she revealed after the race that she had competed with a fractured wrist, which she had hid from officials. She improved on her qualifying position the following year, but retired after just a few laps. Since Guthrie first competed, 8 more women have started in the Indy 500, with the 2010, 2011 and 2013 races featuring the highest number of women at four each. The most successful woman at the Brickyard is everyone's favourite Sonic and All-Star Racing Transform character, Danica Patrick. She started eight races, with her best qualifying position of fourth in 2005, and in 2008 she would finish on the podium in third, the best result for a woman so far. Patrick is also so far the only woman to have won an IndyCar race overall, winning in Japan in 2008. One of the most prominent female racers and personalities in modern racing was the queen of the Nürburgring, Sabine Schmidt. A racer in her own right, she had several wins over 24 hours of Nürburgring, but is most well known for her role in the TV show Top Gear. Initially as the driving instructor of Jeremy Clarkson, and then lapping the Nürburgring in just over 10 minutes in the van. She made several reoccurring appearances, and in 2016, she joined the show as a main presenter alongside Chris Evans and Matt LeBlanc, becoming the first woman to present the show since 2000. She was generally well received during a time when the show was reorganising itself. Unfortunately, it came to light in 2020 that Schmidt had been living with a persistent form of cancer since 2017, and she sadly passed away in 2021. In memory of her, a corner at the Nürburgring was named in her honour. And there are so many more women involved in motorsport that I've not even covered. I'm sure there are plenty of engineers back in the factories, staff who don't appear on camera, and many more that people wouldn't be aware of their importance in the most elite sport on earth. If you're interested in learning about women in motorsport, I recommend the Females in Motorsport channel on Twitter and the like. They do a great job at highlighting lesser known women in motorsport and the wide range of roles they're involved in. I hope this video has highlighted some of the women who have contributed to the rich history of racing, and and I hope in a few years I can maybe remake this video with a whole new bunch of names to add to that list. Hi, thanks for watching the video. Since the F1 season just started, it seemed like it would be a fun video to make. I'd like to thank the following Patreon for their support, Jesse. If you'd like to support me for future videos, check out my Patreon at minty underscore mari. I also have a Twitter where you can talk to me about games, racing, anything really. And until next time, stay fresh.